to that friend so that they would be able to wear it. So we tried to work things out where things just married well with the devices and activities. And because the devices are very non-invasive, it was easy to go ahead and just kind of bring them into their activities that they're already doing uh, without really changing how they perform those activities, which is kind of important to make sure that we didn't kind of bias or kind of affect what we would find. Um, so every week we, and sometimes multiple times during the week, we would give the device to a person who would record. Um, then we would get the data back and upload that to the computer so we were ready to go um, when they came back into the lab. And then a week later, we would have them come in and interview them. And now we, a week has passed and we can get to see how this affects their memory after one week um, when they review their data. So a method we used was auto-confrontation, which is basically having um, participants confront their own activity. Um, so showing their data on a computer screen. So this involves a computer, but also we use the dial interface, and so this allowed us to have pretty fine control over the um, data so that the individual could kind of go at their own pace and look at the things that were important to them, and that way they could kind of have a better like recollection of the things that they remembered. Um, so clockwise would move forward through time, where counterclockwise would move backwards. So there's three different um, buttons that you could use. Well, I guess there's, there's three different uh, controls. There were five buttons that all had the same function. We programmed them so that they would, well, Adam programmed them, so that they would uh, create an event boundary, um, which was kind of just like a segment in the data. Um, we had it so that the outer dial was uh, fast forward, or rewind, so you could go very quickly forward or backwards, and then the inner dial was a frame by frame, again, forwards or backwards, depending on which direction you turned it. Yeah, so basically this just replaced the mouse interface that we're really used to interacting with on a computer because these are large amounts of life log data that's captured and in order to kind of navigate through them in a convenient manner and also so that it's not clicking each image and opening it up, the dial interface allows like an easy interaction with that. Um, and we're very fortunate also to have Adam to help us out with um, creating a browser that we can use that, can, that we can um, couple the dial interface with to scroll through the data very nicely. So um, as we spoke, um, we divided our research into two different, um, two different realms. And so we had two tasks. Um, so the methods that we just explained were all the same for the both of us, but we asked participants to do two different things, one for my research and one for Brendan's research. So I'll begin by talking about mine. So when people were asked to come back to the lab to auto-confront their data, they were asked to think aloud and narrate. So, for example... Oh, here I am in the grove. Awesome. Getting a coffee. That's what I do. And then this is the... Then my semester just... So, this is an example of someone auto-confronting their data. And as you can see, this participant is already somewhat nervous about um, talking about his data because we're not really asking or probing for any questions. We just ask them to narrate um, from whatever comes to mind when they're looking at their data. So it's interesting that you see a lot of people being uncomfortable with that. Um, I titled my research Less May Need More and you'll see why um, as I explain my results a little later. But I wanted to talk about first what my big question was. Um, I am asking two questions. So what type of visual representations facilitate the use of memory? Um, so in these life logs, what types of cues um, actually can be used um, in activity trails, sense cam, and live scribe, and what types of details are remembered? Are there people remembered? Are there objects remembered? Are there places that they've been remembered, um, actions that were done, or maybe the time of day that's remembered? Um, and second, how are recollections reinstated? So I wanted to understand how participants interacted with their past history, since this is kind of a new area of research, so I wanted to approach that. So um, I coded um, a lot of the data based on these four categories. Um, a lot of people, when interacting with their data, they either remembered things, which means they mentally re-experienced in their mind's eye something that happened in the past by looking through their life log data. Um, there were some individuals who <coughs> when looking at their life log data, only knew what was happening, based, basically because it was a routine. They ate breakfast every morning. Um, they went to class at 2 p.m. every Tuesday. So it's kind of a more superficial recollection. Um, a lot of people also guessed. So they, by looking at the life log data, they might not 
exactly remember, but they kind of use the cues that are available in the line plot data to, um, to kind of assume or infer what was happening at the time. And some people completely don't remember um, when looking at these images what was happening. So an example of um, someone not remembering is... I just don't remember that Raga was there. I'm kind of surprised that. So this participant um, sees an image of his friend Raga, but doesn't recall at all that he was there. So um, that's an example of that. And here's another example where um, a man was um, texting something to someone, but doesn't recollect anything at all of what that text message was. <laughs> Who texts? He texts. Who doesn't text? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's interesting because um, from the studies that were done with Emma Berry on the neurodegenerative neurodegenerative patients, excuse me, um, you would think that by looking through the life log data that people would be able to recollect some things um, based on the visual cues that are available in the life log data, but that wasn't the case um, as expressed by this. Um, some examples of people um, knowing by looking through the life log data. So I started my RA application and behind me, or behind this window, there's the RA application. Um, the return application, and then behind that window is the um, my application that I filled out for all of the RA positions, like at Mirror and Transfer Housing. So this participant is clearly just recollecting what his activity was by explaining what was on screen. So this is a this is a case of knowing, not necessarily remembering what he was doing, but just knowing based on what he had to do. But this is more interesting where there's a participant who actually experienced remembering, so actually mentally re-experiencing the moment. This was, this was probably when Neil came, my friend Neil came over, and when he came over I obviously couldn't work too much, so yeah, it was just kind of here for a while, and he was just kind of like chilling on my bed when we were talking about stuff. And I couldn't work on it. What were we talking about? I think we were talking about the RA application actually, and how I had to refill an application out for Warren because I'm actually considered a returner, so we were complaining about that. Or I was complaining to him about that. And we talked about, you know, his love life, what's going on there. <laughs> I actually think I did that just to wake up my screen. I think my screen was black. And then I'm still talking over him. So this participant, it's very interesting because this is what he's looking at. He's looking at the configuration of his screen, um, and he recollects a conversation he had with his friend Neil. So that is a case in point of where a participant's re-experiencing something um, that happened in the past. And it's interesting to know that that was the cue that reinstated that context. So what was important for my research, because it was kind of a behavioral study where I'm looking at these qualitative things, um, was to characterize consistently and accurately um, the, the things that were recalled based on um, knowing, remembering, guessing, or not knowing, and also categorizing things based on the details that were, mem were remembered. So what I expected before doing this study um, was that people would be remembering different types of details based on activity trail, sense cam, and um, live scribe. So I assume that because you know, you're doing things on screen with activity trails, you remember a lot of things about um, the time of day because we tend to associate things that we do on the computer based on whether we're in class, whether we're at work, things of that sort. Um, however, it wasn't the case that there were specific cues that were biased toward each of the different life log data. It was actually the case that all these different life log data help us reinstate a lot of details um, that involve all the ones I listed previously. So people, time of day, actions, places, things like that. Um, but what's interesting to know is that 70% of activity trails and live scribe participants remembered more so than guessing and knowing and not knowing. Um, this was basically calculated by averaging out all the different recollections that each participant had and averaging all of those individuals.